Hey, it's great to have you here today. My name is Rob. I'm one of the pastors here. And for those here for the first time, um, we have a special welcome for you. We'd love it if you can stop by our VIP area. You'll see it out in the lobby. Um, the, a table like this with some balloons that say VIP on it. And um, they'd love to just interact with you and send you home with a gift, a small um, way of us thanking you for being with us today. And thank you for all of you um, for spending an hour of your day with us. Let me just draw your attention to a couple of things coming up here. First of all, if you've been part of Bethel for a while and you say, you know what, I think I'm ready to take a step towards the core of what um, the church is all about, then membership is something you need to check out. It happens next Sunday at 1030. Um, you can sign up and be part of this seminar that just meets for an hour. You'll have all the information you need about membership. And then you can decide if that's a step you want to take or not. Uh, but that's next Sunday at 1030. And then thank you for all of you who continue to give to Raise the Roof. We're almost at the $100,000 mark. And this week we passed more than 50% of the roof has been replaced. So thank you for giving. Continue to give and continue to pray. But thank you for all of that. And then we're in a series that we're calling Shift. And in this series, we're asking every single one of you who aren't already connected to a group here at Bethel to sort of, you know, take a test drive with a group during this shift series. And so the easiest way to find out where the groups are at is you go to our website, the connect tab, you just go down to B groups and you'll see a list of every um, opportunity you have to jump into a group. You know, we have them by interest, we have them by age, we have them by location, all sorts of ways you can get involved. We have groups that are just kicking off for this study that would love to have you here. And then in the lobby, you're going to see a bunch of people in these blue shirts, and they would love to help you, um, you know, answer your questions, help you connect with the group, stuff like that, because life really is better when you're doing it with other people. And so we know that in a church our size, people come to a service and they leave. And God will bless you because you're growing and you're making an attempt to, you know, to grow with him. But you will experience more blessing and more growth in your own life when you begin to connect with other people because God uses other people in, in just huge ways in your life for good. And so we encourage you, stop by our lobby. You'll see that people in these blue shirts interact with them. We love to get everybody connected because as we go through this shift series, we're all discussing the same material and it gives us an opportunity to go deeper. So we're in a series that we're calling Shift because we believe that God's calling us, you know, here we are 100 years plus into our existence as a church. God's asking us to shift as a church. And so we're going to become more deliberate in what we do, more passionate in what we do. But God's asking us to shift as individuals because he's got a plan, a mission for us. And what is that mission? Well, real simple. The Bible says that God's mission, God's desire is this. He doesn't want anyone to be destroyed. He wants everybody to repent. Pretty simple, right? This is God's desire. This is God's heartbeat. God doesn't want anyone to die without being in a relationship with his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus said heaven and hell are real places. And so the Father wants as many people to make that choice that I'm going to follow Jesus and I'm going to spend eternity with him in heaven. And God doesn't want anyone to perish. And so Jesus understood that because when Jesus came, he said his mission was to find lost people and save them. He understood what his purpose was. Jesus is the one who said that he came. He didn't come to be served. He came to serve. If anyone had a right to be pampered, to be catered to, it was Jesus. But Jesus said, uh-uh. I'm not here to be served. I am going to show you what it looks like to serve and how, what it looks like to lay your life down in pursuit of the Father's mission. And so Jesus understood that, and he lived it out to show us. And so when he was inviting people to follow him, to be his disciples, listen to the invitation he gave. Come follow me, and I will transform you into those who catch people for God. So for every one of you who are here as followers of Jesus Christ, this is going to be a fun, hard-hitting talk. So buckle up, all right? And if you're here and you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, welcome this is a great place for you. We love having you here. We go out of our way to make Bethel a place where you can come in and you're comfortable and you have an opportunity to investigate and check Jesus out. So we're glad you're here. But today you get to sit back and you get to see a big picture of what Jesus is inviting you into. And we're going to go through a ton of verses and all of this is on your notes page so you can dig deeper where there's discussion questions on there for groups to work through. But here's what I want you to understand. Every single one of us in this room who are followers of Jesus, right? Jesus is saying to every one of us, hey, guess what? You're part of the team now. 
And part of the T means you got to help me reach more people. Oh, but Jesus, I'm not wired that way. I'm really awkward talking to people. I even get nervous inviting people to come to Bethel. Jesus says, no problem. I'll transform you. Isn't that awesome? Jesus says, no problem. It's not up to you. I will transform you. And what is Jesus transforming us into? He's transforming us into those who catch people for God. This is the mission that every single one is a part of. It doesn't matter what you spend your day doing. At work, at home, at school. Your mission is to reach people for God. I want to talk to you today about radical Jesus. Radical Jesus. We love Jesus. Jesus tells stories and we love those teachings. But there's this radical side to Jesus that we try to explain away. And so what I want us to do is we're ultimately going to end up in Luke 15, which is probably my favorite chapter in the entire Bible. But before we get there, I want to show you everything that Jesus teaches before we get to Luke 15. So we're going to go through Luke 14. You have all those verses on your notes page. I want you to hear the weight of what Jesus is inviting us into as followers of his and the mission as he describes it. So here we go. Jesus, note, he's, at, he's at a big event, and he notices that all who were coming in were trying to sit in the seats of honor. So Jesus gives this advice, and my advice to you as your pastor, when Jesus gives you advice, listen to it. Listen to the advice Jesus gives. When you're invited to a wedding feast, don't sit in the seat of honor. What if someone who is more distinguished than you has been invited? Instead, take the lowest place at the foot of the table. What is Jesus telling us? It's not about me. Can, can everybody say this together? It's not about me. Doesn't that feel fun to say? In our selfie social media world? What do you mean it's not about me? Of course it's about me. Whoever took a selfie and posted it, hashtag, it's not about me. We don't do that. It's all about me. I, may, I have to make myself look good on social media. I want everybody to see what a fab life I have on social media. Jesus is saying, uh-uh, no, 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 no. Every single one of us in this room, when you become a follower of his, it isn't about you anymore. Not about you, it's about him. See, we cannot partner with God in reaching the world if we make it about ourselves. Jesus shows us that. Radical Jesus shows us that. Jesus goes on. Listen, when you put on a lunch, when you're throwing a party... Don't invite your friends, brothers, relatives, and rich neighbors, for they will invite you back, and that will be your only reward. What? Who else are you going to invite when you throw a party? People you like. Radical Jesus says, uh 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 uh, uh. not my followers. Instead, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind. Listen. Then, at the resurrection of the righteous, God will reward you for inviting those who could not repay you. It's not about me yet. What's Jesus saying? If you make this life about you, if you make your church about you, what you prefer, what you want, Jesus is saying, hope you enjoy it because this is all the reward you're going to get. But if you make it about those who aren't here yet, if you make it about those who have no ability to pay you back or help you in any other way, your reward is in heaven. So decide where you want your reward to be. Here or in heaven. Because when we make life about ourselves, Jesus says, this is all the reward you get. But when you make life about those who aren't here, Jesus says your reward is in heaven. Jesus said, wake up and look around. The fields are already ripe for harvest. Jesus is saying, people are waiting to respond. Do you know that the people you work with, the people you go to school with, the people you live with are ready to respond to the message of Jesus? The person you interact with at Wawa, the, the server at the restaurant, the person that cuts your hair or colors your hair. God's, Jesus is saying, wake up. These people are in need of him. The reason he put us here, the reason God puts you in your crazy dysfunctional family is not to drive you nuts. They need Jesus. 
Who else is going to reach them? So Jesus is saying, I'm not playing games with you. It isn't about you. I wanted to show you a picture of a crowd. I figured now's as good a time as any to relive the Super Bowl parade. We good? Woo! Thank God we won Thursday, right? Otherwise, I don't think I could show this picture. There are people everywhere who are waiting to respond to Jesus. Most people do not have a problem with Jesus. Most people have a problem with Jesus followers. We're condescending. We're rude. We don't show love or mercy. We set rules that God never set for us. Why is it that in America only about 15% of churches are growing? If the fields are ripe, they're ready to be harvested. Only about 15% of churches in America are growing. And by growing, they mean they're seeing consistent conversions, not transfer growth, conversions. And they're seeing regular baptisms. Because too many of us and too many of our churches are making it about ourselves. What we want, what we prefer. Instead of saying, how can we be a place where we together worship God, where we together grow, but we do it in a way that's inviting to those who aren't here yet. That's why I'm thankful that Bethel is a place where since we moved into this building, more than a thousand people have been baptized. Hundreds have given their lives to Jesus Christ. And it's because of you, your willingness to say, it's not about me. What can we do to reach more people? That's why we've more than doubled in size since we moved in here. Because you're willing to say, I'm not going to make it about me. The history video that you saw last week, for a hundred years, Bethel has been saying, it's not about me. What can we do to reach other people? Bethel has four values you hear us talk about. They're hanging in banners in the lobby. Which of these four do you think causes people the most angst? Take a guess. The most important person is the one who isn't here yet. I've had pastors who say to me, hey, Rob, you know, I appreciate your passion for the lost. I appreciate your passion for people who aren't here yet. But, woo, I'd never hang that up in my church. Radical Jesus would. It isn't about us. See, here's what happens. We're going we're to end with the story of the lost sheep. We love when Jesus says the most important person, the one, the one who isn't here yet. We love that when we're the one who's lost. Woo! Come on, Jesus. Find me, Jesus. Right? But the 99 have a way of becoming selfish, don't we? We want it to be about us. When's it our turn? And Jesus answered that question. You know when it's our turn? Heaven. See, radical Jesus. He continues. Chapter 14 is a, a doozy. A man prepares a great feast, sent out many invitations. When a banquet was ready, he sent a servant out to get the guests. And he said, hey, come on. But they all start making excuses. The servant comes back and, and tells the master, you know, all the excuses. And it says that he was furious. And so the master says, go quickly into the streets, the alleys of the town. Invite the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. After the servant had done this, he reports, there's still room for more. Listen. So the master says, go out into the country lanes behind the hedges. Urge anyone you find to come. Urge anyone you find to come. Listen to what radical Jesus is saying. Your job and my job is to go out and urge Anyone we find to come. Why? So that the house of the Father will be filled. Radical Jesus. It isn't about me. It's about filling up God's house. Jesus got more. 
Radical Jesus. He continues. If you want to be my disciple, you must, by comparison, hate everyone else. Woo, Jesus, you can't talk like that today. My mommy taught me I'm not supposed to hate anybody. Jesus isn't asking you to hate anybody. But what he's saying is, my passion, my love, my devotion for Jesus has to be so great that anyone else in comparison that I love is a distant second. That's what he calls us to do. It isn't about me. It isn't about what I want. Jesus is saying, Rob, I need all of you. I want all of you. Everything I want. So that people are going to say, what is up with Rob? Jesus, radical Jesus says, by comparison, you have to hate everyone else. Dad, mom, wife, children, brother, sister, even your own wife. Otherwise, you what? What's the word? Come on. You get, you, what is the word? You cannot be my disciple. That's what radical Jesus said. Not me. Radical Jesus said that. It's not about us. If you do not carry your own cross and follow me, you what? Cannot be my disciple. I didn't say that. Radical Jesus said that. See, it's not about me. It's about him. In Jesus' day, you'd be in a town, and you'd see people walking by carrying crosses. You'd see it. The Romans crucified a ton of people. And when you were being crucified by the Romans, you carried your own cross to your own death place. So when you were carrying your cross, it was a death march for you. People knew it. Oh, there's Rob. He's carrying his cross. He's dead. What's Jesus saying? Rob, die to yourself every single day. It isn't about you. It isn't about you. Listen. Jesus, radical Jesus, continues, but don't begin until you count the cost. <laughs> don't, you, don't you love Jesus? Hey, I'm going to ask you for everything you got, but before you begin, make sure you can count the cost. It's Jesus. Who would begin constructing a building if you know you didn't have the money to finish it, Jesus says. Or who would go to war if you didn't think you had an army big enough to win? In the same way, none of you can be my disciples unless you give up what? Are there any good lawyers in a room? I need to find a loophole in this verse and haven't been able to find one. Radical Jesus. It costs you everything. Everything. Then Jesus says, Anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. See, it's not about me. Jesus is saying, listen, it's about the mission. See, Jesus is saying, it's going to cost you everything. But Jesus is saying, I'm going to give you everything. I'm going to give it to you. Wait until you see what heaven's like. Heaven is the payoff. Heaven is the celebration. Not here. This isn't for us. We're on a mission here. Heaven is the party. Heaven's the destination. See, radical Jesus. So here at Bethel, we've been saying, okay, we've been around for 100 years, and we thank God for the shoulders of the people that came before us that we get to stand on. We get to build higher. We get to build bigger. Because of the sacrifice of the men and women before us. I was just talking to somebody from um, Bethel that when they were down in Allegheny. And we were talking about the air conditioning. And you saw it in a video last week. I mean, just think about this. Bethel was the first church in the city of Philadelphia to be air conditioned. Isn't that awesome? Woo! It was about us. No, it wasn't. Do you know why they got air conditioning? They used it as a way of getting people in the church. So if you see the flyers they had back then, it was like, come experience air conditioning. And people are like, "Woo! what is air conditioning? Oh, it feels real cold in the church. Let's go check it out. How awesome is it that we get to build on a legacy where people said, we'll do whatever it takes to introduce people to Jesus. So here's... The star represents where Bethel is, and 
about 18 miles in each direction out from that star is that circle. There's about a million and a half people within that circle. And why did I go with this distance? Well, we have people from up above Trenton that are coming in. We have people from this part of Jersey that are coming in. We have people from the Newtown, Warminster area that are coming in. So people are already driving in to be a part of Bethel within this circle. A million and a half people are within this circle. Who's going to reach the million and a half people in the circle? We are. We have to. That's why we're here. See, realize we're not competing with other churches. We're on the same team. Now, we're going to do things different than other churches. Every church has its own personality, and that's a good thing. So God's going to use different churches with different personalities. Why? Because people who don't respond to Bethel are going to respond to one of those churches. So we cheer them on. We're happy for them. We're not competing with them. Here's the, here's the deal. If every single church in this circle filled up every service they did this week, there would still be hundreds of thousands of people who need to be introduced to Jesus Christ. Who's going to reach them? Well, Bethel said we can do better. We're going to do better. We're, 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 going, to do, we're going to do more than we've ever done. We're going to be more passionate than we've ever been about reaching people. And so a group of us, about 30 of us, met back in January. And we said, what would it look like if that were to happen? At the time, we were running about 1,500 a weekend. So we said, okay, let's set a goal that by Easter, next Easter, we're going to be at 2,000. And then by Easter of 2023, that's five years out, we're going to be at 5,000. It's not about filling up our church. It's about filling up heaven. You, you know what we want to do? We want to say, we want to get to heaven and hear God say, Hey, Bethel, hey, all the other churches in this circle. This circle was the hardest place on planet Earth to die and go to hell from. Good job. That's why we're doing this. How are we going to get to 5,000 in four and a half years? I have no clue. No clue. But here's what I'm telling you. We're going to get there. We're going to do whatever it takes to get there. Whatever it takes, we're going to do. Why? Because Jesus is asking us to reach the people who aren't here yet. So last week as part of our services, we had you write names down of people you want God to bring into Bethel who aren't here. And they're already up on the roof. So they're going to be up there and they're going to be part of this building. Just like the hundreds and hundreds of names on the floor that I showed you last week. Do you know that already four of these people have shown up to church? Four. So last Saturday night, people wrote names down. God brought three people last Sunday without even an invitation. I met another one last night who came, whose name is on here. And someone came over to me and said, he doesn't know, but his name, I wrote his name down. And it's his first time he's ever here. Four people have come already. There's hundreds, if not thousands of names on these boards. We're going to make room for him. We're going to make room for him. See, Radical Jesus is saying, it's not, it's not about you, but here's, here's the exciting thing. It isn't about us, but when you join forces with the Father and you say, your mission is my mission, and I'm going to do whatever it takes to reach people, you realize you're never more alive. You're never more filled with joy. Never. This is what we were created to do. So Jesus goes through all of that in Matthew, I'm sorry, Luke 14. Then he gets to Luke 15, and he tells three stories. He tells a story about... A dad who has two sons, the prodigal son or the lost son, the story is referred to. One son says, Dad, I want my inheritance. I'm done with you. I just want to leave on my own. Dad is brokenhearted. Give him, gives him his inheritance. And he goes and he squanders it. And he has nothing left. And in desperation, he says, I'm going to go back home to Dad. Maybe Dad will hire me as a servant. And Dad sees him, loves on him, says, My son, who was lost, now is found welcome home and he throws a huge party and what is jesus teaching us it's not about me it's about the one who isn't here yet and we get celebrated where in heaven that's what jesus is teaching us jesus tells another story a widow has 10 coins valuable coins she loses one she turns her house upside down looking for it she finds it she calls all her neighbors and says i found my coin the one that was lost is now found let's throw a party what is jesus teaching us it's not about us it's about the one who isn't here yet why we get celebrated where in heaven and then my favorite story 100 sheep 
There are a hundred sheep on here. Trust me, I'm your pastor. I wouldn't lie to you. A shepherd goes out one day, comes back, counts his sheep, realizes there's 99. This is the story that we don't get. We don't get this story. But I want to be honest with you. If I was that shepherd and I've been out all day with sheep and I come back with 99, I'm like, ooh, good enough. Right? I'll find that stupid sheep that got lost tomorrow when I go back out and maybe it'll learn a lesson if it has to stay out alone overnight, right? What does the good shepherd do? Leaves the 99 and goes in search of the one. Who does that? Who does that? Radical Jesus does. Radical Jesus does. And he's asking us to do the same. What is he teaching us? It's not about us. It's about the one who isn't here yet. Our celebration is in heaven. See, it's not about me. I, I, I love that story of the sheep, and my family has given me stuff to re- remind me of that. So one of these say Luke 15. Another one has a goofy-looking sheep on it, and I love wearing this stuff because it's a reminder to me. We all want to make it about us. It isn't about us. So here's what we're going to do as a church. We are going to be more intentional and more passionate than we've ever been about reaching those who aren't here yet. The first thing we're going to do that we're excited about is we're doing a a, a trunk or treat. Two weeks from yesterday. Help us spread the word. You'll see it on social media. Bring out your friends. Bring out your neighbors. Let the kids know we're going to have an awesome time. It is going to be an amazing time here. And how can you help us? Well, you can help us in a lot of different ways. When you go to the store this week to buy yourself a bag of candy, buy one for your house and buy one for this house. You'll see containers out in the lobby next week. Drop off wrapped candy. We're going to buy candy, but you can offset that price by donating. And we're asking you to help us with gallons of apple cider so that it offsets the price as well. Invite people. Plan on being here and, and, and participating. We need people who are willing to decorate your cars. I'm not talking about putting like orange streamer on your trunk. We need creative people who are going to go overboard so that we have destinations in the parking lot for people to go to and get candy. And we'd love for you to help us with that. I did not put this email on your, on your notes page, so take a picture of that. Shoot us an email and say, hey, I'm interested. How can I help? And then invite more, pray more, because we're not only doing it outside. What we're going to do is we're bringing people in the building. So the youth center is going to be decorated. We're going to have stuff going on in here. All the kids' classes are going to be decorated. So as people are walking through the building with their kids to get candy, they're going to say, hey, we got youth group going on here Sunday and Wednesday. We'd love to have your kids come back. And when they're in the auditorium, we're going to say, hey, this is where we do church. We'd love to have you come in for a service. And when the kids go to the kids' classes, the parents are going to be told, hey, this is where the kids do their own classes every weekend. They'd love to have them come back and be a part of it. That's why we're doing this. Now, let me say this. I know in a church our size, there are going to be people who are going to say, you shouldn't be celebrating Halloween, that's the devil's holiday. And here's my response. The way I see what Jesus did is Jesus came, and when he died, he redeemed what was broken, and he redeemed what Satan corrupted. And what I see the New Testament teach is that because of what Jesus did, I can use the stuff of the world because it's redeemed in Jesus' name, and I can use it to point people to Jesus. And so without apology, we're partnering with our community, and we're saying Halloween is an event that people love to come to. God bring thousands of people here. And here's my advice. If you struggle with this, pray that God changes your heart, because wait until you see what we have coming up And if you're struggling with this, you're really going to struggle with some of the other stuff. We are without apology going to say whatever it takes to reach the world, we're going to reach the world. Hey, would you stand with me, please? We're going to pray. Father, thank you that you've given us a heart to reach people. Thank you that you've invited us to be part of your mission. Lord, we pray that you bring in thousands of people for our trunk or treat. Give us the heart, the eyes of Jesus. Let us see the fields that are white, ready to be harvested. And we pray, Lord, as a result of the trunk or treat, that we see hundreds, thousands of lives brought to Christ. We pray in your son's precious name. And all of us agree with this prayer and said, amen.